because Sekiro wasn't hard enough, I challenged all of you to beat Owl as fast as you could from a brand new character, Glitchless. The rules of the challenge are simple. No mods of any kind that affect the game play, no major glitches or bugs, and you must attempt the challenge on a brand new character. The run ends when you defeat Owl in the Harada Estate Memory, which is technically the second time that you fight him. I know I say this every time, but this challenge was extremely difficult. Why are you doing that attack? Oh my! Over the course of this video, you will watch several speedrunners put everything they have into this challenge, and as a result, the ending is very emotional. As much as I like to reward everyone, there can only be one winner and that person will take home $1200. Before we begin, huge announcement, I'm hosting $8000 treasure hunt in Elden Ring and the first hint is actually hidden in this video. I've gone ahead and locked the page on my website amazingchess.gg and the first person to guess the password correctly will win $1000. I've hidden hints in my videos, on my channel, and even on the website itself, so good luck. I've also just launched a project called Elden Beats, where I've remixed over 30 songs from the Soulsborne franchise into lo-fi. This music is perfect for studying or relaxing to, and here's a sample from the 24-hour stream you can find right now on my channel. As you guys know by now, these challenges do not pay for themselves, so this video is sponsored by the subscribe button. Go ahead and press it because YouTube doesn't always recommend. This story begins with a phenomenal runner named ADC, and when the race starts, he chooses the Samurai as his starting class, which is, well, there isn't any other option now, is there? In the Sekiro community, ADC is known as one of the luckiest runners to ever pick up the game, but not for any divine reason, simply because he's the only one who's willing to put in the hours to grind out the luck. In a way, he creates his own luck through sheer determination, and that luck's gonna come in handy because this was one of the most luck-filled challenges I have ever hosted, and that was not intentional. His run begins with him dive-kicking over to Kuro, and this is because there's no run animation without your sword. Because of this, jumping and then kicking in the air makes you land sooner, which ends up being a lot faster than walking. Jumping into this house and talking to Kuro gets him the sword and healing gourd, which are both required to progress the game, and Rather than going around, he's going to attempt the first skip of the run here by clearing this gap so that Kuro can open up the door. Heading up the stairs leads him to the first boss fight of the run, where he intentionally loses before waking up in this room with a new arm. Climbing a wall eventually brings him to a cliff where he's going to go for a delayed jump but then misses it. A delayed jump is basically when you jump on the last few frames just before falling in order to keep your momentum. It doesn't really save time here, but the mechanic itself does come into play for many of the skips we'll be seeing later on, and this is actually the point where ADC's run starts to diverge from the other competitors. In his splits, you can clearly see that he intended to pick up the shuriken, but he doesn't actually do it though, and that's concerning, because the shuriken is a valuable tool. It can be used to save time or make the strategies a little bit safer overall, but if you're lucky enough and things end up going your way, then you shouldn't need it. We'll have to see if ADC ends up regretting this decision later on. Once he picks up the bell from the grandma, he's gonna grab the Gachin sugar from a nearby cliff, which is really useful for sneaking around enemies. When he reaches the Ashina outskirts, he uses the sugar he found to land a stealth blow on the chained ogre, and that's when he starts attacking in a very specific way. By constantly circling him like this, ADC can simultaneously attack and dodge while pulling off the occasional stagger, and this is a very optimal way of tackling this fight. Defeating the Ogre unlocks the challenge's most terrifying hurdles, and the first of them is this innocuous looking cliff. This is known as the Double Canyon Skip, and it is infamous for its difficulty. In order to qualify for a top time in this challenge, every single speedrun category requires this skip, but the risk versus reward just isn't there as it only saves about 7 seconds overall. With only 2 weeks to submit a run and most of them occurring on the final day, considering all the things that could go wrong, the majority of people opted to skip this skip in exchange for more consistent runs instead. One of those runners was Mitch Riz who takes doing this with your eyes closed to a whole new level. 
With previous world records in four different categories, Mitris is a legend at the game and the first person in the world to beat Sekiro blindfolded. For Mitch, the stakes were extremely high. After two long weeks of grinding, this was his final day and there was only enough time for one more run. Yeah, 44 minutes in game with multiple quit outs is close to an hour. Mitch skips the shuriken and goes straight for the bell. After grabbing the Gachin Sugar, he has a successful ogre fight too before taking the safer path around the canyon. After avoiding the snake, he grabs an Akko Sugar which will temporarily increase his attack for an upcoming boss fight. He's going to pick up the coin purse for some extra money and he'll most likely use that on prosthetics later on. And after jumping to this rooftop, Mitch comes face to face with Gyobu. Versus Gyobu, Mitch has one goal and that's to stop him from running away. If Gyobu manages to get some distance, then he can lose a lot of time catching up to him. Deflecting is going to help keep him in place, but Mitch gets unlucky when Gyobu goes for a slow ranged attack. After a little bit of back and forth, he lands a deflect before sending Gyobu into phase 2, and that's when he activates the sugar he picked up earlier. He's going to grapple toward Gyobu to try and keep him near the exit, and you can tell his nerves are starting to get to him because he does end up taking some damage here. Good enough. Not good, but good enough. Mitch is right, that was a decent Gyobu, but it was nothing compared to Grayson, who is a Gyobu specialist. Grayson Flows is known for beating the game without being hit once, and as of this video, he currently holds the world record for it. Earlier in his run, he did pick up the Shuriken, but that shouldn't surprise you at all considering his proclivity towards safety. He also didn't take any chances with the double canyon skip, opting to go all the way around instead. His Gyobu fight is a work of art, making up most of the time he lost not going for the canyon skip. In addition to landing some solid headshots, Grayson doesn't miss a single deflect, and despite going for a slower grapple death blow, he manages to beat Gyobu in just over a minute. That was pretty fast. With the horseman down, Grayson's gonna kill a nearby rat, and after picking up another sugar, Grayson enters Ashina's castle where he's challenged by the Blazing Bull, which wasn't a problem at all for our next runner, Uros. Uros is an interesting one. As the new kid on the block, he has the least experience out of all the runners featured in this video, having only appeared on everyone's radar a few years ago. This hasn't stopped him from setting multiple world records though, but one thing you should know about Uros is that he is not a fan of luck. I actually got a really good laugh when I saw this guy splits. I am so sorry. Ironically, going into the bullfight, he has perfect luck, but for safety, he's gonna spend a few seconds killing the guard at the entrance so he doesn't interfere. As he charges in, Uros lands a perfect deflect on the bull, and the other guys are gonna die in the process. Bull has three main attacks that he can use, but you really only wanna see him use the forward lunge because of how fast it is. Uros is lucky enough to have him do it twice before quickly ending the fight with a death blow. Heading into the gate and off to the side takes him to the abandoned dungeon where he'll grab a pacifying agent for one of the worst fights in this challenge. It is imperative that he does not get seen as he swims through this passage because if he does then it'll ruin his aggro chain. If you're unfamiliar, an aggro chain defines where you spawn in after quitting out of the game. Whenever you quit out, if you're in combat then you'll get sent right back to wherever you first got in combat upon resuming the game. The reason why this matters is because he's about to activate an elevator which takes about 10 seconds to reach him, but calling it and then quitting out makes it so that the elevator's already there when he resumes the game. This saves about 10 seconds overall, which might not seem like much, but it does add up over the course of the run, and knowledge like this is what separates good runners from great ones, and very few are more knowledgeable than our final runner, Ponet, who's been in the scene for a long time. Panich is an extremely active member of the community, sharing knowledge and information whenever he can. For runners like him, this challenge was a community effort streaming all of his attempts live to help raise the competitive bar. This was very noble considering the fact that some challengers decided to hide their runs altogether, but in spite of this, Panich was making really good time picking up the heavy coin purse and then later several sugars from around Simpo Temple. He's gonna make his way through this cave before resting at the idol which takes him back to Ashina outskirts. Now that he has the money and sugar, he'll go ahead and talk to Ishin who at this point of the game is cosplaying as Tengu. From there, Panich buys firecrackers from the merchant and returning to the sculptor allows him to actually equip them. Each runner decides to invest in Makiri counter which is an extremely valuable skill and the best way of dealing with thrust attacks in the upcoming boss fights. 
Warping back to Ashina Castle and narrowly avoiding the Wu guy brings Panesh to the front side of the dojo where he's going to do some unintended parkour. And this is where things start to get dangerous. Every single boss fight in this challenge is capable of ending the run, and one of the main reasons why is because of my rule set. Preventing bosses from fighting back was banned in this challenge, and this meant that each runner was unable to rely on their tried and true methods for keeping each fight consistent. In other words, they actually had to fight the bosses. When Grayson's fight starts, he runs in behind Genny and pops a sugar, temporarily increasing his health and posture damage for about 30 seconds. As Grayson aggressively pushes Genny into the corner, he completely destroys his first health bar and the second one falls almost as quickly. Or else his fight is going just as well too, opening up with a McCary counter and following with a ton of aggression. The main thing you want to see during phase 2 are lightnings, which do cost a little bit of HP to redirect, but if you're lucky enough to get two, then it'll almost completely kill Genny from full. With that said, after another McCary counter, Uros finally snags the posture kill and that brings each of our challengers one step closer to Owl. Coming up next is the most RNG heavy aspect of the run, but there's still a few things they need to do before they get there. Investing in the Ascending Carp skill gives each runner the ability to inflict more posture damage per deflection, which is something you rarely ever see used in these runs. Most runners usually opt for Mortal Draw, but since that was banned in this challenge, they had to improvise. Jumping off of this building and onto this wall leads to the home of Black Hat Badger who sells each runner Yashiriku Sugars, a somewhat risky item that's completely busted for posture kills. Panish does something that none of the other runners did and also invests in an item called Bite Down, which actually kills you when it's used. That seems counterproductive, but maybe it'll come into play later on. The last communed idol sends him back to Ashina Castle where he picks up the gun fort key before returning to Simpo Temple and challenging the armored warrior. This enemy takes no health damage whatsoever and the only way to proceed is to knock him off the bridge. During this fight, Punish makes a huge mistake and misses the timing on a thrust, but he's lucky enough to survive with a sliver of HP. After a series of deflects, Ponich is able to kick the warrior off of the bridge using the time it takes him to fall to consume that bite down. This intentionally kills Sekiro, but because Shadows died twice, he's able to resurrect with significantly more HP than he had before, losing hardly any time at all. Smart thinking. Heading into the temple leads each challenger to the folding screen monkeys where ADC is roughly 40 seconds ahead of the pack. Along with a successful double canyon skip, he saves a ton of time in some key fights early on, getting perfect luck versus Bull, a very fast skinny, and a deathless armored warrior. Versus the monkeys, he starts by looking back to manipulate the invisible one into following him correctly. Doing so stops the monkey in his tracks, slowing him down just enough so that he barely jumps on the ledge making for a quick kill. After defeating the remaining monkeys, they pick up the mortal blade and rice from the inner sanctum, with the latter coming in half for a very terrifying fight later on. Investing in the descending carp skill completes their loadout for now, increasing the damage to an enemy's posture after a successful deflection, but None of that will save our challengers from the most difficult obstacle they've encountered so far, the gun fort. The gun fort, more affectionately known as the fun fort, has a strong chance to completely end your run with absolutely nothing you could have done to prevent it. There are slightly different paths you can take to make this more or less likely, but at the end of the day, it's about a 50% chance that you will get shot, fall to your death, and be sent all the way back to Ashina Castle. ADC does get shot early on, but he manages to press through until he reaches the bridge. Looking down is probably an attempt at manipulating the gunner's AI, as enemies will act differently if you aren't looking at them. As ADC clears the bridge, that was insane. Rather than falling to his death, ADC clings to the branch instead, refusing to die as he makes it to the top of the mountain. Looking back, you can see that the game suffered a visual glitch here as if even it had trouble processing his fortune. He's not out of the woods yet though, and in the cave up ahead is a mini boss known as Centipede where ADC demonstrates some of the most aggressive gameplay we've seen so far. As he deflects Centipede's barrage, he is squeezing in way more attacks than any of the other runners, and after his initial flurry, you can see him get in two quick attacks before going for the death blow. 
For the second health bar, ADC is careful not to come down with an attack because that could spell certain death for him if Centipede did his 3 hit combo instead. Once this mini boss falls, swimming past the serpent leads to a pack of monkeys which he intentionally aggros to set up an aggro chain. Quitting out will activate that chain, putting him at this cliff where he's going to jump down toward the branches below. In the cave up ahead, he makes his way around the serpent again, and after grabbing a divine confetti, he's eventually taken to the boss residing inside. Grayson and ADC bring two different approaches to this fight, with Grayson's being a little bit safer. After an initial backstab, Grayson goes for double Ichimonji, which seems to make the fight a little more consistent, if not slightly slower on average. ADC, on the other hand, throws caution to the wind, opting for a slightly riskier strategy with a faster payoff than the best case scenario. On his way into the forest, Grayson picks up another Yash but almost forgets the snap seeds nearby. After getting the drop on the Mist Noble, Double Ichimonji is going to make short work of him, but the next one won't be as easy, and Grayson is fully aware. Calm down, calm down, calm down, calm down, calm down. Going into this fight, he activates his confetti along with the Yash too, which both increase the likelihood of a health kill. In addition to the occasional stun, the snap seeds in this fight inflict a generous amount of health damage, and Grayson is doing an outstanding job of avoiding her attacks. Grayson chooses to keep things close, but Uros plays it safe instead, and this is the first time we get to see the shuriken some runners picked up early on. As he's punishing the monk for jumping away, Uros overcommits and ends up taking a ridiculous amount of damage as a result. As lucky as he is to be alive, he still manages to keep his cool, and while that fight was a bit difficult, it pales in comparison to the Guardian Ape who single-handedly ended many runs. Now, a lot of things can go wrong in this fight. Some challengers called it a coin flip, but I think it was much more of a dice roll. Despite the odds, ADC takes his fate into his own hands and opens up with a firecracker. Ichimonji keeps his posture damage high, and that's when he goes for three more. ADC gets super lucky here when Ape goes for a sweep, and that's going to let him jump on his head for even more posture damage. While Ape's running away, he actually can't recover any posture, so one more firecracker from ADC sets him up for a death blow. This is where things get scary. Phase 2 Ape has a screaming attack which builds terror, and if that purple gauge fills completely, then you'll immediately die. The rice and pacifying agent from earlier reduce this buildup, but if Ape decides to scream twice and you can't interrupt it, you'll either die or lose about 15 seconds from running away, which is almost as bad as dying. ADC is counting hits here, and he has to because a certain number will make Ape stagger. As ADC continues to combo him, did you catch that? Right when Guardian Ape starts up the second scream animation, ADC who's already attacking just so happens to get the stagger he needs to interrupt it. That was either 200 IQ or very, very fortunate. Regardless, ADC does not waste this opportunity and he goes on to finish this fight with the fastest time we've seen so far. With most of the RNG behind us, we enter the final stretch of the run and it's still anybody's game. The Homeward Idol brings each runner to Ash in a castle where they confront the ape's memory in exchange for enhanced attack power. In the water outside is Yash, and climbing to the top of the castle leads to Shinobi Owl, a lesser version of Owl Father. The strategy in this fight is simple. Three attacks facing away and one facing towards makes it so he doesn't block him, but the fifth one he does block since you're facing him. Because Al technically can fight back during this loop, it wasn't against the rules and I have to applaud the runners for their creativity. With Al down, they use the memory for another attack boost and talking to Kuro advances the plot further. Eve's dropping is going to start the purification questline and that'll finally give each runner access to Al Father himself. They're going to pick up the Gachin Sugar on the rooftops outside and conversing with Emma sends Sekiro back to the temple where he unlocks the first of two memories. Most runners stop to pick up this hidden Hako, but things don't really pick up until ADC misses the death blow on Shinobi Hunter. For the first time, we get to see what happens when a risky strat doesn't pay off, and things go south fast. Comparatively, Uros, who did pick up the shuriken, uses it to defeat the archer in the back who's known to make this fight more difficult. This brings Uros and ADC within 30 seconds of each other and almost a minute ahead of the competition. Further inside is a wounded owl who gives each runner the key necessary to challenge Lady Butterfly. Before they can reach her though, they have to defeat Juzo, and trust me, that was easier said than done. Grayson's making great time, but he knows that fighting Juzo with all of his goons is a death sentence. Instead, 
He uses the Gachin from the rooftop to play the game as intended for once, and after the majority are gone, he moves on to Juzo. Got very lucky there. Why are you doing that attack? Oh my! ADC had a better idea, and after using his Gachin, he runs over to the right hand side where Juzo will follow you, leaving the others behind and evening the odds. Up next is Lady Butterfly, and this is an intense fight because one mistake will usually result in a death. ADC pops a Yash and then opens up with a few attacks. He wants her to kick back like she's doing, but he doesn't want her to jump back because that'll ruin his combo. You'll notice he's doing a lot of 180s between attacks, and this is referred to as a dead angle. It's basically him unlocking the camera to hit her with a free aimed attack so that he can bypass her guard altogether. After a phenomenal phase one, he gears up for phase two, and ADC is extremely nervous. You can tell because he makes some huge mistakes. As soon as she jumps down, he puts her in the corner and everything is going according to plan, until it isn't. ADC misses his 180, and this, this is where you die. Luckily, Lady Butterfly is going for a slow sweep, and ADC is able to hit her right before she can hit him. In all of the chaos, ADC messes up one more time, not getting the turnaround, and this time she finally jumps away, but ADC is prepared, using firecrackers as insurance to make sure she doesn't kill him. That was a stressful fight, and while ADC didn't die, each mistake brought girls closer to his time, separating them by a mere 14 seconds. All that's left is the second memory, which comes with its own set of obstacles. After aggroing Lone Shadow at the start, ADC uses a Gachin and takes the long way around so these enemies don't attack him. Once the idol becomes usable, he's gonna enhance his attack power one last time before challenging Juzo. This fight is much worse than the first one, and even ADC doesn't push his luck here. Uros and ADC decide to take out Lone Shadow first, and then they kill the archers before quitting out to de-aggro Juzo. Resuming the game lands them a free death blow, and now that he's alone, Juzo goes down pretty easily. With over $1,000 on the line and the fastest times in the challenge so far, ADC and Uros give it everything they've got. Uros uses a confetti to help keep his damage output high and then a fire to grab Al's attention. From there, he immediately runs away and after activating a Yash, he baits Al into the corner. There are no gimmicks in this fight. Uros' strategy is basically to keep Al cornered and just react to anything he does. If Al makes it out at any point, then Uros could suffer a huge time loss. After landing the first death blow, Uros uses another Yash, and a perfectly timed dash resets his corner pressure. Despite having the least amount of experience, it's clear that Uros has put hours into this fight, and when his run is finally over, he ends with an amazing time of 42 minutes and 24 seconds. Can ADC beat that? With perhaps more nerves than his Lady Butterfly fight, ADC activates a Yash and then heads over to the corner himself. He dodges Al's attack to try and put him in the corner, but Al has other plans in mind. Fortunately, there is a second corner, and ADC does everything in his power to keep him there. As he enters phase two, ADC has less than one minute to defeat Al, and things take a turn for the worst when he escapes the corner. At the end of the run, ADC had a time of 42 minutes and 14 seconds, which was the fastest time out of the four runners we've seen so far. But this story isn't over yet, because there is still one challenger left with the potential to beat ADC, and his name is Mitris. With less than an hour left to submit a run, Mitch defeats Gyobu and makes his way over to Blazing Bull. 
He opens the fight with a perfect deflect, and Bull is kind enough to go for two lunges. With that boss down, Mitch challenges Genny next, who does give him a little bit of trouble in his first phase, but he still finishes with a decent time. On the temple's bridge is the armored warrior, and the end of this fight is, is very nerve-wracking. Thank goodness. Oh my, that was almost a disaster. After defeating the monkeys and ringing the bell, Mitch enters the gun fort and his chat starts praying for him. They know that this is where most runs go to die. Mitch jumps into the heart of the fort and rolls the dice. These challenges are extremely difficult, and I want to thank everyone who participated. I got really sick in April, so I had to push the video to May, but I really hope it was worth the wait. Special thanks to Mitriz for helping me understand each run, and thanks to all of you for making it this far. If you enjoyed the video, then go ahead and subscribe, and feel free to check out each of the challengers below.